Last time, on Battalion 13 the podcast, the group learned of Madeline's suicide and began making plans to go home. Welcome to Battalion 13 the podcast, episode 9. Dominator, accompanied by a small Red Beetle squadron led by Red Beetle 1, returned to Lapis 7, home of her precious squid demon. Lapis 7 was a water dimension contained within a dense and labyrinthine cave system. Dominator donned a deep sea dive suit. She called out to the squid demon, who squeezed out of its hiding place and floated before her, large and menacing. Its likeness was almost akin to a Terra 1 vampire squid, but its tentacles were much longer, and its cloak webbing was short by comparison. It was also albino and the size of a small building. Hello again, lovely. I've got a favor to ask of you. The squid demon warbled in response which made Red Beetle 1 shift uncomfortably. To him, its response felt like a rippled, menacing snarl through the water. I need you to kill a person for me. It'll be fun. You even get to eat them. The squid demon's body rippled a bit enthusiastically, like it hadn't had the joy of eating in a long time. Red Beetle 1 tapped Dominator's shoulder. Madam, this thing, it won't eat us, right? No. Unless you keep talking... You're just here for decoration, remember? Don't do anything. Red Beetle 1 backed down. Lovely. Just ignore him. Now you'll have to come to Terra 1 with me in order to... It warbled again, this time in defiance and stubbornness. It apparently didn't want to leave this place. Don't be like that. You get to see the sun and fresher water. It crooned. There'll be lots of people around, fit for eating. You can have as much as you like and then come back here when you're satisfied. It warbled in obvious delight this time. It reached out a tentacle to grab Dominator in an ecstatic hug. When Red Beetle 1 threw a stalagmite at it, piercing the tentacle, it roared in pain. No one hurts Madam Dominator! Red Beetles, protect our mistress! Don't let that thing near her! Red Beetle 1 began using the water to hold it in place while others charged at it. Red Beetle 1 stood in front of Dominator as protection. You idiot! You've hurt my poor Zeras! Now we're all dead! It was going to... No, it wasn't. It was perfectly content. Now he's enraged. I had everything under control until you interfered. But... Go away. Let me handle this. She shoved Red Beetle 1 out of her way and began trying to calm Zeras. Red Beetle 1 ordered a retreat, tearing a rift into space and disappearing back to base. Lovely. He didn't mean it. It's okay. It's just me now. Mommy Dominator. Zeras didn't listen. Instead, it looked at her, seeing Red, and began attacking her. She dodged left and right, running for her life. One straggling Red Beetle got impaled before escaping pierced through the abdomen with a spike on the inside of the squid demon's tentacles. Zeras then ate the red beetle's corpse in one bite. Now it charged onwards with more vigor, trying to capture anyone and anything it could see. Dominator ran through the caves, cutting down stalactites and hurling them at it with her laser whip. She didn't want to hurt the squid demon. After all, it was like a beloved pet to her, but she knew she couldn't outrun it. She silently apologized to it in her mind, but kept running. She then found a chasm in the cave, stretching farther than anyone could see. The squid demon was so close that it could almost grab her. And so, knowing it was right behind her and unable to stop suddenly, she leaped off into the chasm. Dominator tore open a rift to somewhere, anywhere. The squid demon then howled a soul-wrenching sound, a noise the blend of a whale cry and a blood-curdling scream. It couldn't change trajectory fast enough to run from the rift, and so it flew through at top speed. As the rounded tip of its head disappeared through the rift, Dominator let go of the rift, and like a projector screen, it disappeared from existence. A piece of its tentacle got stuck in the rift, and the sheer fabric of reality severed it. As it fell into the chasm, the blood dissolved into the water, and the limb disintegrated as if nothing happened. Dominator continued to fall into the chasm. She tore rifts open around her, but couldn't fall through any of them. She finally used her whip to cut the worlds open, below her, and fell back into the renegade base. She came into contact with the floor, 
drenched and exhausted. She tore off her underwater suit and breathed in a breath of life, relieved. She lay on the floor panting and exhausted physically, her hair soaking in the water that dripped from her suit into a puddle. Her eyes struggled to focus due to the strain put on them. But when they finally settled and came into focus, a pair of authoritative boots was the first thing to grace her vision. Madeline was sitting in a small campsite where she had settled for the night. She had enough supplies to get through a couple more days, but without Jake, she was uncertain of how she would get more supplies or even know where to go next. She began to write in her journal. November 11th, 1995. Jake, where are you? Are you even alive? And what was that thing that took you? Wherever you are, if you're still alive, I will find you. I have a couple of cans of beans left, and I found some more tuna fish in the bag you dropped when the creature took you. You've been holding out on me. Probably a good thing. I would have eaten them immediately. All of a sudden, Madeline heard a tearing sound in the sky. She looked up to see a rift, and through it came the creature. She could tell it was the same creature, because it still had a wound where one of her arrows had struck it the last time she saw it. It swooped down toward her and attempted to grab her. She ducked out of the way and grabbed her crossbow. She loaded it as the creature regained altitude and banked for another dive. Then it took aim at the creature. She didn't want to kill it. If she killed it, she wouldn't be able to find Jake. She also didn't want it to take her and do to her what it did to Jake. She needed to be able to follow it through the rift, but it was in the sky. Maybe the only way to go where it took Jake was to allow herself to be captured. Or maybe she could take control of it somehow. She wasn't sure what to do. Where did you take him, you bastard? The creature dove for her again, and this time it caught her. She fired another bolt into its arm, and it let her go. She found herself falling at an incredible speed. And just as she was about to hit the ground... Maddie! Darian woke again in a cold sweat. Kristen was shocked awake by Darian shouting Madeline's name. Darian, calm down. It's okay. It was just another dream. No, it wasn't. It was the other Maddie. She was in serious trouble this time. Some kind of dragon-like thing was attacking her. She fired a bolt from her crossbow, and it dropped her from an enormous height. I think she's had it. I didn't even know this version of her, and now she's probably dead. I have to tell Sam right away. Darian got up and got dressed in blue jeans and a black t-shirt. He pulled on his socks and put on his shoes. Darian, where do you think you're going? I have to see if she's still alive. If there is some version of my sister alive, I have to help her. Darian was panicked. He walked over to Sam's old room and knocked on the door. What is it? I just had another dream about Maddie. She was almost captured by a dragon or something, but she injured it and it dropped her from a tremendous height. We need to see if she's okay. Okay, calm down. The only way I'm going to be able to get the info I need from your mind is if you calm down. We need to get you into a meditative state. How? You need to slow your heart rate. You're going a mile a minute. Darian closed his eyes and began to concentrate. He calmed himself and grinded his energy. Sam touched his forehead and closed her eyes. She began to open a viewing window to the dimension that Maddie was in. Darian, look. Darian looked through the window and saw that there was no one there. The fire in the campsite had not been properly put out and still had some glowing embers. What does this mean? Look, her backpack and journal are still sitting there. Should we go through and grab them? I don't think that's a good idea. I think you only saw part of what happened here. I think we're missing something. I already have to bury one version of my sister. I don't want to have to bury another. I don't think she's dead. She never hit the ground. Maybe the creature grabbed her again. Are you sure we shouldn't go through? There's nothing we can do now. We need to get ready to bury our Madeline. I'm sorry. Darian hugged Sam and then went back in his bedroom and tried to get a little more sleep before the funeral. Darian again found himself in the recliner in his older brother Sean's house. This is not the Sean who is asleep with Alicia right now. It was the Sean from the future. The one who was helping him get through this difficult time when they both lost their little sister. This time he knew it was a dream. He got up from the chair and looked around. Sean, are you here? Out of the shadows, 
the older version of Sean appeared. We don't have a lot of time, Darian. I have some renegade war plans to show you. How did you get these? Doesn't matter. It's just good that I have them. It looks like there's going to be another attack on the Academy. I think they're going to be bringing some new blood into the mix, too. New blood? Yes. The ones that you have met before are Dominator and Destroyer. It looks like they have plans to use someone called Oblivion. He carries a small ion cannon on his left arm. He's highly destructive. You may need help against him. These plans should give you the knowledge you need to take control of the situation. Destroyer and Dominator. There was a woman on a dimension cycle leading the attack, and she had these troops called Red Beetles. I never knew the woman's name or the names of any of the vampires. The woman's name was Dominator. She commands the Red Beetles. So you never saw Destroyer? Not sure. What does he look like? He's a cyborg. He's dark-skinned and wears a long black coat. He must have been at the last attack. I was sure he was there. That doesn't even sound remotely like someone I saw at the attack. He must have been there. Maybe he was doing something else while Dominator was attacking. Yeah, I don't know. Darian thought for a moment. Then he had an idea. The lights flickered, and that's how we discovered the attack. Maybe he was behind that. Maybe. Anyway, we need to talk about the upcoming attack. I know right now you're still at our parents' house for the funeral, but someone needs to go back and warn the people at the Academy. One of the things about this attack is that for some reason they are after some plant extracts, but I don't know what they are or why the renegades want them so badly. That's weird. Can you show me an image of Oblivion? Sean concentrated for a moment, and a 3D image of Oblivion appeared in front of Darian. Darian stepped back a few feet, nervous about the image. The image was of a tall man wearing a black and silver flight suit and brandishing a black mini ion cannon on his left arm. His head was covered with a helmet and face mask. He definitely looked intimidating. So this is Oblivion. What can he do other than blast a hole in someone or something? It's very dangerous. He can incinerate any human target. He is over 1,000 years old. He used to go by the name of Edge back when he was a good guy. When he was a good guy? About 50 years ago, he was a member of Battalion 13. He was badly injured by a renegade attack, and then they used their retrieval system to bring him back to their base. Anything good within him would have been destroyed by that process. They used to teach cadets about him at the academy, but it became too depressing. Retrieval system? Yes. The Renegades used a system that teleports them back to their base. It doesn't change anyone who wears a Renegade retrieval pin, other than repairing minor injuries automatically. But it takes any dead or critically injured from either side. And once it repairs their body, it reanimates them without their human soul. Then they become Renegades, soulless creatures under Renegade control. That must be what happened at the ball. When we got back to the auditorium, there were no bodies left on the floor from the attack. Precisely. Now when you wake up, I want you to tell Sam to send Jake back to the academy so he can start the team training. It must be done before you guys graduate. Your friends that are still there should start immediately. Alright, I'll tell them. But Jake should stay throughout the funeral, if only for Sam. No choice. This attack could happen at any time. Now, wake up! Darian opened his eyes and then got up and got dressed. He didn't wake Kristen. He thought this time he should better sleep. He walked out of the room and gently closed the door. He then walked to Sam's room and softly knocked on the door. So, you sent the squid demon where exactly? Dominator looked up to see his face. He was scowling. I've... No clue where you wanted them to be? Dominator struggled to her feet, still feeling physically exhausted from her escape. No. In fact, it's in the exact wrong location from where I wanted it to be. It's on Terra 1. Now, why would I have a problem with this? You don't want them near us. You need them to be... Very good. 
Now that it's so close, the UAD will find us, and all of our time and planning has gone to waste again. I was a little bit panicked because they were. I don't need excuses, Dominator. I need results. Should you fail, here's your new and most likely final instructions. Find me a target. Give me a reason to have that thing on this plane of existence or so help me. I will have to wipe you and it from existence so as to not be discovered. Am I clear? Yes, Nightmare. Dominator knew failure wasn't an option, and she knew she wouldn't fail again. She knew that discovering wouldn't help her find Adam. In fact, it would set her back. And her poor lovely must be so hungry anyway. And so she went to look for a target. Sam and Jake were in bed, having just talked to Darian about his dream of future Sean. They both knew that this meant that Jake had to go back to the academy early and miss the funeral. I really don't want to leave you here alone to deal with all this. I don't think we have a choice here. Darian's dream warns of another attack on the academy. The students aren't ready yet, and that could happen at any time. Come to think of it, I wish future Sean had told Darian a date and time for the attack. We'd be much better prepared if we had that. Well, the fact is, we don't know. And if it happens while we are all away... It means that some of our best people won't even be there to defend the place. The remaining cadets need to be prepared. I can't do that on my own. Well, I can't go with you this time. Do you have anyone else in mind? Actually, yeah. What about Jed, Sergeant Drake? If we need somebody to whip our cadets into shape, he'd be the perfect person to do it. That's a great idea. You better give him a call and see if he's available. Good idea. Jake grabbed the phone and dialed his number. It was long distance, so he made the call as quick as possible. He didn't want to leave Eugene and Andrea with a huge long distance mail. A few minutes later, Jake was ready to go. I really hope this attack doesn't happen too soon. We need time to train the cadets, and it'd be nice if Darian and company were available too. I'm going to go now. Jed said he'd meet me there in an hour. We'll see you back after the funeral. Sounds good. Have a safe trip. Love you. Love you too, babe. Jake kissed Sam and then left. Dominator sat on a park bench, anxiously awaiting Nightmare's arrival. She held a dossier in her lap, the manila envelope being crinkled by her tense fingers. Nightmare appeared and sat on the bench beside her. Dominator looked down at the envelope and smoothed it out hastily. Hello, Dominator. Do you have more bad news to give me? No, I asked. Let me guess, you sent the squid demon to the UAD now, and it has a festive sticker attached to its face saying, To your leader, from Nightmare, have a happy birthday. And it has a return address on the back. Oh, you really shouldn't have. I could have sent that on my own. No, I brought you here because I followed your orders. This is... So what new messes have you brought me? There isn't a new mess. I did what you asked. And I didn't make a mess in the first place. This fine target is... Cut the crap. This isn't a sales pitch. If you hadn't failed, we wouldn't be here right now. And this wouldn't be a huge problem in the first place. You've screwed us all over. And when we get discovered, it'll be your fault. End of story. She passed him the manila envelope, meekly yet annoyed. She already knew it was her fault. He didn't need to rub some vinegar in her salt-coated open wound. This is an excellent target. Despite having powers, he has no training and no clue how to use them. Not that it will make a difference to you. Nightmare opened the dossier, reading its contents. This target has plasma kinesis. Yes, and he has flight capabilities. Interesting. But he's restricted to a suit. Seems like it can harness his powers and tame him. When we catch him, though, he will be vulnerable and out of control. Very interesting. I approve. Nightmare placed the document back inside the manila envelope. He'll be in Boston tomorrow. Wait for him in the Boston Commons, by the fountain. I promise he'll be there. All right. Congratulations on not failing me again. 
You'll wait nearby in case anything goes wrong with this. If the UAD shows up, I'll be ready. She flashed her whip and a vengeful smile spread across her face. Half dressed in a navy suit, with a loose tie around his neck and undone buttons, Sean stared at himself in the mirror and shook his head. Cerulean. That's the right shade for the occasion. Somber and understated. It's the one shirt I didn't pack. What you're dressed in looks fine. We really need to get going. It's not about the fit. The suitcase that Alicia had so carefully packed was now in disarray. Sean began unbuttoning the Carmen button-down dress shirt. And this one, definitely not right. Most people just wear black. What's wrong with black? It's a mockery. The goth thing. I just can't do it. But what did she like? I don't even know my own sister. You knew her, Sean. You just didn't know her the past couple of years. That's the problem, isn't it? And she didn't even remember me. I've been so selfish. What about something from Darian or Eugene's closet? I'm sure we can find you something that works. Fuck! No one other than his reflection heard him. Why? How could you? Why? He gripped the edge of the desk that was oddly placed in the bathroom of the funeral parlor. His anger was getting the better of him. Keep it cool, Max. Keep it cool. We need to chill. For Darian, Andrea, and Eugene, and Matt. <sighs> oh god, Matt. Her twin. The other half of her soul. Shit! He sank to the ground, his head in his hands. A few deep breaths later, Max stood up and straightened his tie, his cuffs, his hair. His reflection smirked at him. Who am I kidding? My hair is always a mess. Maddie's always trying to. He broke off that train of thought and turned away from the mirror. With one last steadying breath, he opened the door and walked into the hall of the funeral parlor. He stood in the viewing room, staring at Madeline's coffin. Eventually, he would go in a hearse and onto the graveyard where Maddie would be laid to rest, alone and in the dark. Well, not completely alone. He made sure to put a stuffed hamster beside her, in memory of that moment when they finally connected. Max closed his eyes against the pain. He wanted to talk to someone. He wanted to know where to go. The Kane family was out of the question. They had their own grief to deal with. He opened his eyes and spotted Chad leaning against a wall, lost in thought. Chad looked up as Max approached. Hey, man. You okay? Sorry, I know that's a stupid question. Max stared at him for a moment before answering. No. Yeah, honestly. No, no. I'm not okay. How are any of us? How is any of this okay? He gestured at the scene around them. I don't get it. One minute we're laughing at our graduation, the next we're putting our friend in the ground like she's some sort of plant. But plants grow when they're planted, right? They come back. And she's not coming back. She's never going to come back. What the fuck, Chad? What the fuck happened? Chad put his arm around Max's shoulder in a sideways hug. I know, man. It's fucked up. Max jerked away from Chad. You don't know. How could you? You didn't know her like I did. Didn't love her like... He stopped as he realized what he said. I loved her. Oh, God, I loved her. His head dropped to his chest, and he sobbed. Yeah, you loved her. You loved her, and you know what? So did I. But you know what else? It was you who she loved. And you who said he'd be there for her. So why weren't you there? Why couldn't you keep one simple promise, you self-centered freak? Why couldn't you keep one simple shining soul from shattering? She was my friend. Max felt the anger in him rising, felt his blood boil and his fists clench. He saw red. He tasted blood. He felt pain. He felt the need to hit Chad until he stopped talking. He felt the desperation in his soul of wanting to disappear until everything was right again. He felt... He felt the truth of Madeline's passing. Yeah, and she was my fucking moral compass, so you might want to back the fuck off, Chad. You got over fast enough for someone who says he loved her. Leave Cynthia out of this, Max. It's not my fault you weren't man enough to admit how you felt. Chad's eyes narrowed, but he took a step back as Kristen came between them. The two of you need to calm down. Right the fuck now. 
This is a place for remembering Maddie, not for letting your testosterone-fueled feelings of failure get the better of you. She guided them to an area near the door, where the rest of their group was watching. Madeline was something to all of us. Denise, she was your protege. Max, we all know that she was your great love. She was the daughter of Eugene and Andrea. She was my... She was my sister. We all loved her. And we all lost her. So let's stop with the petty bullshit and come together. For her. For those of us left behind. For those of us who have to go on without her. She stopped and looked at each person in the eye, tears streaming unchecked from her own eyes. Let's go say goodbye. Somewhere on the Severn River, a fisherman was in a boat fishing. Suddenly, the water started bubbling, and an ancient creature emerged. It was the same creature that Dominator was supposed to lead to Terra One. The fisherman, startled by this unbelievable sight, panicked and began to row as fast as he could to get away from the creature. A loud screech was heard coming from the water, then a tentacle burst out of the water and grabbed the fisherman. He was taken under the water and was immediately eaten by the enormous squid demon known as Zerez. It then found its way to a small beach and hid just out of sight of anyone who may be watching from the shore. Of course, being that it was pretty close to winter in Savannah Park, Maryland, there was no one there. This was a problem for Zerez because he needed to eat. He began to use his power to communicate with life outside of the water, to lure anybody walking or driving by. In just a few short hours, there were people lining up to walk into the water and sacrifice themselves to this beast. They had been mind-controlled by this enormous squid demon, Zerez. Ian Gelsinger sat in the Boston Commons, a place he went to clear his head when he needed to think. He had just been accepted into the Navy, and boot camp would begin next winter. He wasn't sure if this was the right decision for him or not, but he wanted to be an engineer, and he knew this could be his fast track to success. Ian plucked his guitar strings, playing songs as he hummed lyrics to himself under the darkness of night. Not many people were around at this time, so the usual day chatter was gone. While Ian strummed his guitar, he heard the plunking of water droplets from the nearby fountain. Ian was excited to put his engineering knowledge to good use, but a part of him feared judgment from his peers. He didn't have a good grasp on what he could do, nor did he know why or how any of it manifested. Sometimes his hands would shoot this blue-white smoldering glowing stuff, and he would accidentally hurt people. One time he got really jealous of his girlfriend, who'd been cheating on him, and ended up burning a hole through the guy's hand in a fistfight. Ian had gotten into a lot of trouble for that one and he couldn't risk it at boot camp. He also remembered one time in class he began spacing out and didn't realize anything was happening until he felt his leg hit the desk. He realized he was floating. No, flying. He was flying. And once he realized it, he immediately fell back into his seat. The fear of judgment made the idea of success seem too far away. But now that he had his chance, it didn't seem so far. He had already developed a suit to help him maintain control, though it was still in the early development stages and could use some more fine-tuning. Ian continued contemplating until a low, gravelly voice interrupted his thoughts. Ian Gelsinger. Ian stopped plucking his strings, making a scratching sound when he stopped. Ian turned around to face the voice and saw a man standing there. The man resumed talking. You've a destiny to fulfill, good sir. Destiny? What destiny? A destiny to change the world for the better. The world, nay, every universe, needs a lot of change. A new order of peace and freedom and civil rights. To give all life their basic needs and complete equality in society. What does this have to do with me? Well, it turns out that I'm bringing about this new era and I need a little help. You see, my friend, I need you. Just not all of you, you understand. Not quite, but I think I get the picture. And if my destiny is to help you, I'd like to know what I'm getting myself into first. 
You, my good friend, will help me and take out these people who will stop me and kill those who oppose this new era. It's your purpose in life. Uh, no thanks. You dare oppose me? Ian walked past the man with his guitar slung over his shoulder. Ian Gelsinger. Ian stopped and looked back in cold fear. I don't like the idea of killing people. I want peace and equality, but I don't particularly want to hurt anyone. If you want my help, study Martin Luther King Jr.'s teachings first. Peace, dude. Nightmare took a step forward and grabbed Ian by the collar and pushed him to the ground. I wasn't asking. Ian, afraid, felt his hand grow warmer and warmer. He grabbed the man by the face, burning his flesh, and pushed him off. Dropping his guitar, Ian took off down a walking trail towards an exit of the park, hoping this man wouldn't be able to follow him while his face was burned. Ian's hand glowed bright, lighting his way as he ran down the dimly lit trail. However, the man caught up with him. The man tackled him to the ground, pinning him. Let me go! Ian struggled under the man's weight. The man pulled out his dagger. Don't worry, your help is greatly appreciated. The new world you will help me bring about will be perfect utopia. Your sacrifice will be read about for years to come. Nightmare then planted the knife deeply between the man's shoulder blades, piercing his heart. The blade then glowed faintly, and Nightmare felt Ian's life force sucked into his vest. And then Ian's body transformed into energy and dissipated. Nightmare's hand glowed. I'm done here. Your help will be greatly appreciated, Ian. I hope this partnership is truly beneficial. And then Nightmare left. Another soul captured. Another ability procured. Darian was standing in the hallway at the funeral home, writing his eulogy speech. It wasn't going well. He could think of lots of nice things to say about his sister, but most of those things only made sense when she was alive. Why was he writing the eulogy? Denise was the speechwriter of their Scooby gang. Suddenly he felt an energy surrounding him, penetrating him. It didn't hurt, but it felt like some form of fire around him. When he looked at his body through his third eye, he could see a blue flame surrounding him. When it was over, he felt a new sense of purpose. For a moment, he felt an odd presence, but that quickly went away. He put down the pen and started to walk toward the exit of the funeral home. Sam saw Darian leaving in a hurry and tried to stop him. Darian, wait! Where are you going? The service is going to start soon. But Darian kept walking. A moment later, Max spotted him. Darian, where are you going? I have to go. People need me. People here need you more. I have to go. You have to stay here. We're getting ready to bury your sister. Sorry. Gotta run. I'll be back. I just have to take care of something in Zaverna Park, near where my cousin lives. No, Darian. You can't just run off in the middle of Maddie's funeral. That's just fucked up. Look, I don't have a choice. I have to go. What the fuck is wrong with you? You can't do this. Max, I can't be here right now. Darian pushed past Max and ran out of the building. He began to run faster and faster until he was out of sight. Darian! What the hell is that about? Oh dear, looks like Matt is here. Matt's car had just driven into the parking lot. It was a beat up brown sedan. Max, you have to go after Darian. We need him here with his brother. I need a car. I'm not ready to fly that far and I can't be seen flying here. Take mine. Here are the keys. It's the green 1990 Ford Taurus. Max grabbed the keys and headed for the car. Matt got out of his beat-up sedan and headed towards Sam. Sam! Sam was caught off guard by the sound of her youngest brother's voice. How did he remember her? Matt, you remember me? Of course, yeah. I missed you, sis. Was that Darian leaving? Where was he going in such a rush? Not sure. He said something about going to Severna Park. A long walk. Actually, Darian can fly. He learned how to recently. But he just flew off. Max is going to try to follow him in my car. 
Great. I get stuck with uneven claws and Darian gets to fly. Life is so unfair. Getting down to business, though, I need to see Maddie. Sam pulled back close, but didn't let go. I'm so sorry, bro. Matt pulled her closer. I wouldn't be able to get through this without you. Me either. Where's Sean? Not here yet. Let's go inside. How could it be possible? Matt remembered Sam and Sean. This is something that Sam would have to look into once he returned to the Academy. Was Matt different than Darian in some way? Right this way, Matt. Sam led Matt into the funeral home and brought him to their parents. I really like this one. Your father's suit looks good on you. Sean straightened in the mirror, tightened his gold cufflinks, and added his gold chain to the taupe brown suit. Alicia grabbed her purse from the dresser and sighed deeply. Shall we go? Sean reached for the door, but his hand wouldn't turn the knob. His hand began to shake. No. No, this one isn't right either. Wood paneling and worn paisley carpet covered the entryway of the Stauffer Funeral Home. Andrea and Eugene had been greeting the visitors as they came to pay their respects. We had such a good time at that Cure concert. Do you remember that, Chad? Sure do. Maddie and I talked the whole way there in the back of the Dodge Caravan. Chad began thinking about how that was the night that he really began having feelings for Maddie. He wanted to kiss her so badly, but she was so young. Another part of him knew that Max wanted to date her, and he couldn't hurt one of his best friends. But the look in her eyes with her head on his shoulder, the way she looked up at him, it was like the whole world was a place they could explore together. Maddie ran towards every adventure. So he did what he thought he should do at the time, and focused on distracting Maddie with stories about the forts he and Darian used to make in the woods near their house. She wanted to hear, it's Friday, I'm in love. When she did hear it... Andrea began to tear up and buried her face in Eugene's chest and jacket. Matt and Sam walked in just then. I remember that trip. You were all coming to see me at reform school up in Philly. Maddie and Kristen danced all night long. And when she couldn't see the band, Chad let her sit on his shoulders. We rocked so hard. Good times. She certainly earned some experience points in this life. She missed you so much. Is she in there? Straight through those doors, son. Let me go with you. I'm all right. Matt charged directly toward the viewing room, but stopped about a foot away from the body. She's not in there. No, son. Not anymore. Eugene began to embrace his youngest son, but was caught off guard when Matt's claws jabbed him in the thigh. What the... She's not in there! Matt began growling and howling. His claws tore Madeline's coffin cushions into tiny shreds. Her body was nicked with multiple lacerations which oozed multicolored fluids. Eugene's combat training kicked in as he attempted to block his youngest son from causing further harm to him and others. Unfortunately, his leg was punctured and was now bleeding profusely down his suit leg. Eugene grabbed his tie and wrapped it around his leg to stop the bleeding. Chad, Kristen, and Sam surrounded Eugene and Matt. Something within her fight response reacted, and Kristen activated her shield to protect Madeline's body and Eugene from further harm. Matt, we're all upset right now, but please try to breathe. You're going to hurt the rest of your family. I know that's not what you want right now. I'm going to take Mom and Dad home to fix up Dad's leg. Kristen, you stay here with Matt. Try to keep him calm. Chad, maybe you can help. Can you tell Darian about Matt and then come back and help Matt and Kristen? Sure thing. Matt swayed back and forth, brimming with kinetic energy. Deep inside, all he could feel was white-hot rage. He knew that something was wrong when he got Maddie's message at school. Somehow he figured that when he saw her the body, he'd know what happened. But instead, this eggshell, this cotton doll of a body, had no remnant of the sister of whom he shared a soul. No! I will find the cause of her anguish, and I will slice them. I will cut them. I will 
bust their motherfucking skulls in. You kept us apart! Ah! Kristen began to send love energy to Matt while she maintained a crystal amethyst bubble around him. She knew that Matt was part of Madeline and could empathize with his cries of pain. If you control Australia from the beginning, it's generally a good strategy. I always thought South America was a better strategy. Risk is about taking risk, am I right? Can we just play the game? All cadets, report to the amphitheater immediately. Hey guys, I guess we better head over. Cynthia opened the rec room door in sync with the announcement. I guess Chad isn't back yet? Not yet. It's been nice having the dorm all to myself. Without Darian, Chad, Max, and Kristen, the academy seemed less cheerful, but it was a beautiful day, so it was difficult to feel melancholy. The amphitheater quickly filled with students, but for some reason, it felt sparse. This place seems astronomical without the decorations. Sure does. Bodacious big. You missing Chad a lot? Look, Jesse. Ample space for acrobatic hijinks. Oh, we're working around it. Part of me wants to know and part of me doesn't. Let me tell you about my suit later. Don't use the suit for that. Ooh, what are you boys up to? Quiet. Mr. Madison is starting. This amphitheater appears as if it were built for a much larger assembly of students. When I attended here with Sean and Alicia, there were definitely a lot more students. What happened? I don't know. I guess we're here to find out. On the other side of the Coliseum, a strawberry-haired girl and John Matthews began to make their acquaintance. This assembly seems important. Looks like the whole school is here. I've got a bad feeling about this. Maybe you shouldn't stand too close. I invite disaster. The scars, they were from botany class. John reviewed the arc-like scars along the girl's face and neck. Tell me more. Let's just say I got intimate with the Blitzen Ast. Rings like a Tesla coil, but vibrates the body like electroshock. John ran his index finger along her chin and smiled broadly. Let's call them battle scars. I'm John. I'm Elizabeth, Liz for short. Nice to meet you. Maybe I'll live long enough to get some battle scars of my own. Jake Madison took the stage and waved his hand to everyone in the crowd. Good afternoon, cadets and faculty. I stand here today to deliver some grave news. As you're aware, the academy was attacked during the cadet ball by the renegades. We lost a significant number of staff and students, and many are missing. It's even possible that some of your friends and favorite instructors are now your enemies. No, not possible. Inevitable. At this point, we know from the footage captured that several dozen were sired. We also know that the attacks are not going to stop. We've received some information that will help us prepare for future attacks. Looks like the Renegades plan to assault multiple dimensions with several new threats, one of which is a genocidal killer named Oblivion. He carries an ion cannon that can obliterate anything in its path. Also, the Academy will be on full lockdown. No one goes in or out without strict security measures. With that in mind, we're going to fast-track your combat and practical application training. You're here because you represent the best of the best. Recruiters from your planets found that your skills could help the United Alliance of Dimensions in protecting the galaxy. So Jed, you ready to prep these cadets? To be honest, Jake, I'd rather be touring North America's Terror One Longaberger basket factories with my wife Susie. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, though, cadets, you are ready. You'll be assigned to a partner whose skills complement your own. You'll be tested against one another in various mental, psionic, and physical challenges. Next week, you'll receive your assignments on your tablet PCs. If you need any help, Fred Sanders can get you sorted. Cadets, are you ready to train for the fight of your lives? I can't hear you. Yes! yes! I still can't hear you. 
Yes, yes Sergeant! Okay then, let's go kick some renegade ass. Woo! Convincing Davina to grant him leave was not easy with the Academy on lockdown, but as the closest friend to Eugene and Andrea, she approved of Edward Mahegg's request. As he pulled into the parking lot, he spotted a man wearing an eye patch that he thought he recognized. So he went over immediately to make his condolences. Hi, I'm Edward Mahegg, close friend of Eugene and Andrea. You seem familiar. Have we met? Good to make your acquaintance. I'm Madeline's te- I was Maddie's teacher. Christopher Davidson. I don't remember you. I'm actually an instructor as well. History. Maybe you can introduce me to everyone. I've never met her parents. Sure. Yes. Of course. The sign at the front of the small prayer chapel read, Viewing, 2 to 4 p.m. Madeline Kane. Eddie Mahag and Mr. Davidson walked right in. Kristen, is everything okay? Where is everyone? Matt, is that you? By this time, Matt was tied to a chair with his hands behind his back. Kristen and Chad used a metal bicycle chain to wrap his arms. To an onlooker, it would appear that Matt simply had his hands behind his back. Professor Mahag, how kind of you to come. Kristen began to usher Eddie to the side of the room. We have an obsidian situation here. Sir, why don't you come with me and we can find you some refreshments. I see. Alicia and Sean are not here yet. Andrea and Eugene had to go back home. Matt had an incident when he saw Maddie. Excuse me. I know that I was just Madeline's teacher, but she confided in me that she missed her twin. Are you Matt? Hey. Do you guys mind if I spend a few minutes with Matt? Chad. You go ahead with Professor Mahag. I'll stay with, um... I'm sorry, who are you? I'm Christopher Davidson. I was one of Maddie's teachers. Nice to meet you. I'll stay with Matt and Mr. Davidson. Kristen stayed on guard duty and gave Matt a piercing stare, letting him know that if he got out of hand, she'd be there to stop him. She stepped out of earshot to give them some privacy, but kept her eyes directly on Matt. Mountains of clothes weighed heavy on the guest bed. Sean was now dressed in a gray suit. Sean, sometimes you have to accept that you don't have the right outfit for the occasion because, well, because the occasion isn't right. Huh? It's an event no one wants to go to. You don't want to say goodbye to her. Getting dressed means that she's really gone. And you did know her, Sean. Don't you remember the long nights we spent at the academy talking about how much you missed home? That game you and Sam played with Matt and Maddie that you made up about the Labyrinth movie? Sean smiled with his memory. Oh yeah. I was the goblin King Jareth and Matt and Maddie were the infant babies I would steal from Sam. We made pillow and blanket forts all over the house. Darren always ended up playing some superhero to rescue the twins. Suddenly, Sean grabbed Alicia and cried deeply into her shoulder, finally releasing some of the grief he'd held in since he heard the news. About ten minutes later, Sean looked up at Alicia. Thank you for being patient with me and saying exactly what I needed to hear. Sorry about your dress. I guess it's my turn to change. Darian was running faster and faster. Then he decided that he had to get where he was going quicker, so he took off into the air and began flying to Savannah Park. He was over Howard County when he almost got zapped by lightning. It was a major close call, but this did not deter him from flying. As he flew closer to Anne Arundel County, The weather got worse, unnaturally worse. It was getting difficult to fly, so Darian flew above the clouds. The air was thin and very cold, but Darian's determination to get where he was going was unyielding. He would not be dissuaded. Then, as he arrived over Zarena Park, he noticed that the weather was much worse. He looked around, and after a few minutes, he saw what was happening. There was a rift open in the middle of the Severn River, off the shore of his cousin's neighborhood. Carrollton Manor. A huge squid-looking thing had obviously come through it, and for some reason, people were just walking right into the water and into the clutches of the squid. Darian realized that he had to get the creature back through the rift somehow before it closed. He just wasn't sure how to do it. Hi, Matt. I'm Mr. Davidson. 
Maddie's English teacher. The raw emptiness inside of Matt was so overwhelming. Despite the friendliness of this introduction, no muscle in his face could be brought to movement. All he felt was sour agony. You know, Maddie wrote a lot about her kinship with you. As a twin, you must feel this loss more than anyone else in your family. The poems and stories she wrote were always twin stories. Mr. Davidson looked behind the chair and saw Matt's claws chained to the feet of the antique Edwardian chair. You were special, like Maddie. This comment broke Matt's listlessness, and he looked into Mr. Davidson's eyes, questioningly, almost accusatory. Yeah, I know you are. He had quite the reaction, as I can see from her casket. I could help you, you know. Control your anger. I used to let my anger control me. I had to learn how to shut my emotions off, like a faucet. I haven't had my emotions under control in quite a while. When I came into the room, did you sense at all that you knew me? Actually, yeah. I feel like I wanted to trust you, but I'm not sure why. Sometimes in life, you meet people who become mentors, guides. They help you become the person you're meant to be. And who do you think I am? You have the potential for greatness, no matter which side you choose. I'm hoping that if we work together, we can stop the prophecy. Huh? You and Maddie, your powers attracted a third eye Pagano demon named Iriseth. How the hell do you know this? Let's just say that I was hoping to protect Maddie. If you work with me, then maybe we can stop this demon from getting you and the rest of your family. Holy shit, balls. I knew there was a reason why Maddie contacted me at school. When did she contact you? The same day she... That's what I figured. Look, we don't have much time. We need to keep this on the DL. I'll contact you in a couple of days to figure out how we can protect you and your family. Okay. One more thing. See if you can find anything about this message. It's the only thing I have on Erisa. The man with the eye patch handed Matt a tiny slip of paper with just one small paragraph of writing. As Matt spoke the eerie words, needles ran up and down his spine. This twin will be scrambled inside its shell, laid in a basket, and end up isolated. When a set of twins leaves the nest, one will find a new egg. If the egg is broken, it will cause this egg to rot and attack the other eggs. Well, it does mention a twin. Sean and Sam are twins too. I'll look around Maddie's room and see what I can find. Good idea. Excuse me, I'm going to talk to your sister now. Make sure she's okay with us keeping in touch. Probably best to keep the demon stuff under wraps for now. Got it. Hey, thanks for, you know, the talk and everything. Of course. I'm here to help. Excuse me. The man wearing an eye patch felt so familiar to Sam. The black trench coat he wore was pulled up around his neck. When she turned to look at him, it confused her as it broke her grief. I'm sorry. My sister, she... Samantha kept looking into the man's one visible eye. It mesmerized her. I... No, I'm sorry. I wanted to lend my condolences. I'm Christopher Davidson, Madeline's English teacher. Yes. Yes, you are. I'm sorry. I'm Samantha, Madeline's sister. Thank you for coming. Of course. I'm here to help. Maddie was a very good writer. She'll be missed greatly by her friends at school. I was helping her to get some of her poetry ready for publishing. I hope you'll consider letting me help you get it published. Wow. Okay, yeah. I didn't know she wrote any poetry. My career has me traveling a lot. I should have known her better. We never know when these things will happen. But I should have been there more for her. Work isn't everything. I mean, my job is really important, but I barely knew her. Maybe you could spend some time with Matt while you're here. They were so close. I'm not sure why I'm telling you all of this. It's okay. Madeline meant a lot to me, too. I had the feeling I would be needed here today. I'm glad you came. 
Sam let the tears fall as she shared probably a little too much about her personal and professional life with this kind stranger with the eye patch. Without Jake here, it was nice to have someone she could talk to, and even better, someone who knew Maddie, the good parts of her. Darian launched himself into the sky again and flew closer to the creature to get a better look. There was a capsized fishing boat, and Darian could see that the creature was eating people. There was a line of people on the beach across the river, walking into the water to be eaten. They must be hypnotized. I have to stop this. He suddenly felt angry. This thing didn't belong there, and Darian wanted, no, needed to end it. He rushed into the water and punched it in the head. His fist bounced off the creature, having done little damage to it. He did, however, get its attention. It screeched at him and attempted to grab him with a large tentacle. Darian flew out of the water and then went for an exposed piece of the creature's head. He flew close and punched it again. This time it grabbed him with a tentacle and began to squeeze the life out of him. Darian tapped his communicator, but he couldn't make a sound. Max was driving towards Severna Park when he heard a small click in his ear from his communicator. He tapped the spot directly under his ear where the communicator was. This is Max. Go ahead. The communicator was silent. Something was wrong. He continued to drive towards Severna Park, as that was where the signal was coming from. We're here. Finally. Would you try not to sound so fucking snarky all the time? What? I've been pampering you all flipping day and now I'm not allowed to be the slightest bit sarcastic? No, my sister just fucking died. Give me a fucking break. Well, excuse me for having feelings of my own. Alicia turned off the car and fled up the stairs to the event room. Sean walked quickly after her while stomping his feet. Sean and Mr. Davidson brushed shoulders as they crossed in the stairway. Each looked familiar to the other, but they both turned away quickly, eager to get where they were going. Excuse me. No problem. Using the tracking element in the communicator, Max was able to use Darian's embedded communicator to track him down. Once Max arrived at the small beach on the Severn River shore, he immediately saw the squid demon squeezing the life out of Darian. He acted quickly and flew over to the creature and faced partway into the tentacle that was holding Darian and then became solid, which cut off the tentacle. Darian fell into the water, Max went after Darian and pulled him out of the very murky water. He flew Darian to the shore and set him down, then looked him over. Darian had a few suction marks on his chest where the clothing had been torn off, but was otherwise fine. You ready to get back out there and help me handle this thing? Yeah, just need to catch my breath. Let's do this. The two of them launched into the air and went back to the fray. Darian landed a few semi-effective punches and Max phased through different parts of the beast, cutting off more tentacles. The squid demon got angrier and grabbed Darian with two of its remaining tentacles and started to pull in opposite directions. Darian was being stretched beyond its limits. Max saw this and immediately flew into the tentacles and unfazed to cut them off. It worked. It dropped Darian, and Darian flew about a hundred meters in the opposite direction. He activated his communicator. Maxwell, Knight. What are you calling me for? We're in the middle of the fight of our lives here. I'm going to get some distance from that thing, and then ram it at my top flying speed. If you do the same, we may be able to push this thing back through the rift. Get it in position, and on my signal, we ram that thing back into the hell dimension it came from. Yeah, I got you. Max flew about a hundred meters away from the creature. Then when signaled, he flew as fast as he could towards the squid demon. Darian headed there at a pretty substantial speed as well. They both hit the thing and pushed it back through the rift. As it was almost through, it swiped at Darian and knocked him under the shore. Darian was out cold. Max finished pushing it through the rift and watched as the rift closed. Max flew to where Darian landed and checked on him. Darian, you okay? Darian was still out cold. Max noticed a fading red mark on Darian's forehead. He also realized Darian wasn't breathing. Darian, you better wake the fuck up. I'm not going to bury you and Madeline both today. Max got into position to start CPR, but before he could do anything, Darian woke up. (coughs) (coughs) Oh man, what the hell was that? I feel weird. The red mark on Darian's head had faded completely away, leaving no evidence of any wound from the fight. Oh fuck, thank god. I think you have another ability. What do you mean? You weren't responding a minute ago. You weren't breathing or responding. 
I think you were actually dead. How do you feel now? Sore and a bit achy, but otherwise I think I'm okay. But man, there was a point where I think I couldn't feel my legs, or really the rest of my body. But I feel them now. I don't think anything's broken either. But I definitely can't fly right now. I might be too dizzy to walk. Looks like you can heal pretty fast. Must be nice. Nothing about that was nice. Did we win? I got that fucker through the rift and then the rift closed. Darian looked back out at the river where the creature was before. Glad that's over. Let's get back to the funeral. Did you drive here or fly? I drove Sam's car. I didn't want to fly here like you did. What the hell were you thinking coming here by yourself? Darian looked down at his beaten body, and then looked up sheepishly at his best friend. Let's get into the car and get back. I have a feeling you're not the only one who was looking for me. Max flew Darian over to the opposite side of the river where he had parked, and then drove them toward the funeral home. You seem better. I'm feeling calmer. Thanks to Mr. Davidson. He's a nice guy. Helped me, too. Who's that? One of Maddie's teachers is here. Oh, good. I'm going to help Maddie. This isn't her fault. She didn't know what she was doing. She really didn't. Matt, now that Maddie has passed, we need to remember to speak about her in the past tense. Otherwise, we won't be able to grieve. But what if... I mean... Never mind. Everything's gonna be okay. When this is all over, we can have a big family dinner, and Mom and Dad will be so much better. Did you take drugs? <sighs> um, yeah, I just knocked back a couple of Pams. <laughs> no, really, I didn't. Or maybe I did. Matt laughed hysterically. It echoed throughout the room. We need to get our little brother some help. I think we could help him control his abilities at the Academy. You know that's a pipe dream. UAD would never allow it. Okay, fine. I'll take some time off to help him out. Teach him what I've learned. That may be advisable. He's certainly fractious, physically and mentally. Not sure that reform school has helped him at all. Madeline took a moment to steady herself, the trip through the portal having disoriented her. She inhaled deeply, lifted her head, then stopped breathing altogether. There, less than twenty feet in front of her, lay what her brain told her was a dragon. She shifted backwards, preparing to flee, and in doing so, stirred the strange air around her. This caused the dragon's chromatic scales to shift in color. Her heart leaped in her throat when the beast's nostrils flared and its tail swished in agitation. Maddie tensed to run, but stopped when the tail moved again revealing a very recognizable, if battered, face. Jake! Oh, shit. Maddie's cry seemed to echo through the air, and for a brief moment, time froze, but the sound diminished away without any further movement from the dragon. Follow the creature, you said. Go through that unknown portal, you said. Jake's counting on you, you said. Who said? Oh, yeah, I said. Silly me. So now what? Maddie paused a moment then steeled herself. She crept towards the dragon. Okay, Maddie, you've got this. Get around the dragon, grab Jake, and run off into this weird void place that you know absolutely nothing about. Oh, man. Jake was lying on his side beside the creature, his feet towards Maddie. She had gotten close enough to grab his boot when she felt something warm brush against her left cheek. She chanced looking up into Jake's face and saw three eyes staring back at her. Two were round with fear and set in a face covered in dirt and scratches. The other was once a bright silver orb that was now a ruined mass, as it had been pierced by an arrow, her arrow. The dragon seemed to be blind in that eye, as it was trying to smell rather than see her. However, it still had another good eye. As it raised its head high above hers and began turning its functioning eye towards her, Manny grabbed Jake's boot and pulled him across the ground, away from the dragon. Get up! Get up, get up, get up! Come on, Jake, we've got to go! Jake was trying to raise himself, but the pain in his side, a result of the dragon carrying him off, kept him from moving. Maddie's eyes filled with tears as Jake collapsed back onto the ground. Just, just go. I obviously can't go anywhere, and there's no sense in both of us dying. 
They both looked to where the dragon was watching them. This made Maddie angry. You're giving up? You asshole! You fucking asshole! You're giving up and staying here to die, and you're just going to leave me all alone. Again! You asshole! Well, you know what? I came here to rescue you, and that's exactly what I'm going to do, you big bitch. So put on your big girl panties, grab onto me, get on your feet, and let's get the hell out of here. Maddie pulled on Jake's arm, and he cried out in pain. She pulled again, but stopped when it became clear that Jake wasn't going to be able to move. She sat on the ground and put her back against what felt like a wall. She looked around, noticing small changes in the scenery. Things that were starting to look familiar, like trees in the distance, with small rocks on the ground by her feet. She also noticed that the dragon wasn't moving. In fact, it had its head slightly turned, staring straight at her with its remaining eye. It almost looked... confused. Well, come on! Madeline stood up. Come and get it over with. Here you go. A nice juicy bit of human girl, fresh from the farm. Come and get me. I got a lot less gristle than Jakey boy over here. Hey, I'm not that old. Shut up. I'm mad at you. And if we're going to get eaten, the last thing I want to hear is you complaining about how old you are. Maddie waved her arms. Um, hello? I'm right here, you big scaly yet surprisingly pretty monster. Come and get me. Yum yum. Jake stared up at her and shook his head. So, Maddie noticed, was the dragon. It wasn't precisely shaking its head, though. It sniffed towards Jake, then sniffed at Maddie, stopped, then did it again. Its good eye widened as it took two steps closer, then repeated the process. Even Maddie stopped in her baiting of the creature to watch. When it got to three feet away, it sniffed Jake's shirt, and Jake winced expecting the next thing he felt to be teeth. But instead, the dragon moved its snout to a defiant Maddie and inhaled at the front of her chest. Hey, watch it, buddy. The snout pressed against her and roamed over her chest. It nudged her, and she fell over next to Jake again. You were just inviting it to eat you, and now you're admonishing it for getting fresh? He continued to shake his head as Maddie blushed. The dragon nudged Maddie again, this time pushing her away from Jake. She scooted back towards her friend, but a tail came between them and swatted Jake away from Maddie. Jake cried out in pain again. Hey! Madeline grabbed the creature's huge jaw in both her hands. You want me, you take me, but you leave him alone. She held on with all of her strength, expecting the dragon to finally take a bite out of her. But then her eyes opened wide with astonishment. There was something happening. Her hands had gathered some of the strange bluish air around them, and a soft light was starting to pulse around them. The dragon, too, had stilled. The two of them, dragon and human, stared at each other, everything else seeming to fade out of existence. As she watched, the destroyed eye reformed and took on the same silvery sheen the other eye had. And at the same time, she felt the pressure of her injured leg lessen and disappear. She felt a nudge in her mind, not unlike when the dragon nudged her chest. In Madeline's mind, she could hear the dragon's voice. He said, it's you. But there was no voice, only an understanding that passed between Madeline and Fafnir. Fafnir. Your name is Fafnir. And you're a dragon. Or at least that's the closest thing that I'd be able to understand. She looked at Jake, who was struggling to sit up. He was looking for me this whole time. He thought it was you, but only because we've always been together when he came to get his... What? She looked back at Fafnir, and a moment passed. Apparently, I'm kind of like his soulmate. He's been looking for me ever since I was able to open portals, and he took you by mistake. He figured out that you weren't the person he was looking for when you weren't able to heal him. She looked in awe at her hands. When we touched, it was like he was me and I was him. We just flowed into each other, were connected, and we were able to heal each other, see? She rolled her ankle around, showing Jake that it no longer hurt her. A thought occurred to her, and she walked over to Jake. She placed her hands over his ribs and thought about that glowing blue light and tried to heal his injuries. She grew more aggravated by the moment as nothing happened. Then Fafnir placed his head on her shoulder. Jake stiffened, then relaxed as a warmth spread throughout his torso. When the light faded, Maddie and Fafnir moved back and looked at Jake, 
who stood carefully. He moved from side to side, stretching his arms above his head, then bending at the waist. He winced when he leaned toward the injured side, but still smiled. I'm sore, and the side that had the most damage still hurts a bit, but Matty, most of my pain is gone. Thank you. Both of you. Matty smiled at Jake. Fafnir says not to get used to it, and that you smell funny. Oh, the giant lizard says I smell funny. Ha ha ha. Jake looked around at the area that seemed to be changing before his eyes. His vision skimmed over what, to him, looked like foothills and valleys, and a copse of trees there in the background. Madeline noticed him looking. It's the ethereal realm, Fafnir says. He says it doesn't have a stable form per se, but it's completely dependent on the person or being seeing it. Basically, that their thoughts help to give it form. He also says that we might want to find another place to be soon. We're not the only things here. She looked at the horizon, where greenish lightning was flickering. This way. She took a deep breath, closed her eyes, and cupped her hands in front of her. As she parted them, Jake saw the most stable portal she had ever opened take form. And through it, he saw... Home. Darian and Max were just getting to the gravesite. It was getting dark out, and they knew they would be in trouble for missing most of the viewing, but Darian didn't feel like he had a choice. He had stopped home to change his clothes, and his wounds were almost all the way healed, which he found odd, but he didn't have time to question it. He changed into an all-black suit and cleaned himself up a bit so he wouldn't look so out of place at the gravesite. Once there, they got out of the car and walked to where everyone was gathering. It was cold, but the cold never really bothered Darian. Max was wearing a heavy coat, and so were the rest of the guests. Darian did look a bit out of sorts, and the fact that he wasn't wearing a coat made him the odd man out. Eugene spotted Darian first. Darian, where the hell have you been? You missed the viewing. There were people who wanted to see you. Sorry, Dad. I had to fly to Carrollton Manor and Serena Park. There was this giant squid thing, and it was eating people. We had to stop it. It was huge, sir. We couldn't actually kill it, but we drove it back through the rift that it opened. It's another world's problem now. This is not the day to go off and fight a big beast. For the love of God, we're burying your sister today, Darian. This is unacceptable. There are other heroes in this world. You should have contacted the UAD immediately when you saw that thing. It is not your responsibility to save everyone, especially on the day we're burying your sister. Dad, I'm sorry. I didn't have a choice. It was like I was called down there. I was pulled. Something hit me earlier. I felt this amazing energy, and when it was done, I felt the urge to go to Carrollton Manor and stop this big demon. But I was lucky Max followed me, because if he hadn't, I would have been eaten for sure. I suffered some pretty bad injuries, but miraculously, I'm almost all the way healed now. Andrea had walked over to where Darian, Max, and Eugene were, and had heard the last part of what Darian said. You mean to tell me that on the day we're putting Maddie in the ground, you risked your life? We could have lost you too? What were you thinking? No, don't answer. You weren't thinking, Darian. If you still lived with us, you would be grounded for a very long time. We can't actually take any action against you for this, but just know we are very upset with you. Mom, I'm sorry, but those people needed help. And that's what I'm training for at the Academy. Look, we don't get to have normal lives in this family. It's not just that. You went off by yourself to face this thing without knowing if you could defeat it on your own. And if Max hadn't shown up, you'd be dead. You need to learn to work together as a team. If it was that bad, you should have brought Chad and Kristen too. They have abilities that could have helped you. You can't do this alone. Not ever again. Do you understand me? Max put his hand on Darian's shoulder. Well, I'm glad I showed up when I did. I'm going to go talk to Kristen and Chad and let them know what happened. They have a right to know. Yeah, go ahead. Hey, Max? Yeah. Thanks for your help. Yeah. Max walked over to the gathering around the coffin. Darian turned his attention toward his parents. You're right. I can't face these kind of monsters on my own. Next time I'm bringing the whole gang. Come on. Let's go bury your sister. Eugene put his arm around Darian's shoulders as they all walked over to the gravesite. No, I wasn't Madeline's best friend. In fact, she held a grudge against me for a while because of what I did to our friend Chad. 
But that's all in the past now. Strangely, there was a note in Maddie's room, the black dress that she's wearing in the casket, which says, For my funeral. And below that she wrote, Denise will do the eulogy. Guess that's good, because Deering didn't have time to write anything. Maddie was a very stubborn young woman. Guess there was a part of her that was too stubborn to let her live. And now each and every one of us will have to go on living in this world without her, as if she doesn't exist. When we know that a part of her always will. A shard of her soul flew into mine when she lost her life to suicide. And this will hurt for a very long time. We may never recover from her absence in our life, but as we lay her physical body into the ground, we will know that she is no longer struggling with a voice inside her telling us that she is not worthy. Madeline made an impact on each and every one of us. That's why we are here, to celebrate her life, not to mourn it. We spend every moment of our lives after this one missing her. We won't really be living our own life. So from this day forth, I challenge you to not spend your time wishing she was here, because you'll never be the person you are meant to be. Remember the good times that you had with her. Think of her fondly and let the rest go. Live your life to the fullest, and be the people you are meant to be and carry Maddie with you always. That's what Maddie would want. It's going to be okay. I know it's going to be okay, because those who matter the most to us never really go away. They will always remain in our hearts and our memories. Thank you for listening to the ninth episode of Battalion 13, the podcast. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Battalion13HQ. Email us at b13 at Battalion13HQ.com. Support the show by becoming a patron at www.patreon.com forward slash Battalion13HQ.